Hello and welcome to our special digital to author talk coming live to you from the Sydney Opera House. My name is Min and we are really excited today because we are joined by over 40 schools from across Australia. That's really exciting. The other really exciting thing is that we have a very special guest joining us today. He is the author of numerous hilarious books such as Gangster Granny, Billionaire Boy, Mr Stink, The Boy in the Dress and his latest Bad Dad. I think you know who I'm all talking about. Everyone shout it out. Fortunately. It's David Williams. Fantastic. Can everyone give a really big welcome to David? Hello. Hi, Hello everybody. <laughs> David, thank you so much for joining us here today thank on this you. really special right, we're tour. We're going to hear all these students from around Australia and some of them have prepared questions and okay. they're going to be asking you those questions directly. Fantastic. And then I've got a few of my own as well Good. that from my reading the book, I really want to know the answers to as well. Uh, now, listen, is everyone ready to learn a little bit more about David and his secrets to writing a really great story? We're ready to go? All right, so the first question comes from St. Catherine's Catholic School. The question is, what inspired you to be a writer and did Roald Dahl influence you to be an author? Well, I'm a huge fan of Roald Dahl and I was quite a reluctant reader when I was a kid until I found a book that I really loved and that was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And that got me into reading books and you don't become a writer unless you like reading. About 10 years ago, I had an idea for a story. I thought, what would happen if a boy went to school dressed as a girl? How would his friends react? How would the teachers react? How would his family react? And I thought, as it's a story about a child, it might make a good children's book. And I wrote the book and it was a modest success, but I loved doing it. And that made me want to write more and more. Fantastic. And, and the next question comes from Gunnada South primary school. When did you discover your talent to write and why did you target this particular age group? Oh, uh, well, I didn't think I would be a writer when I was a kid. I really wanted to be a comedian. But to be a successful comedian, you need to write your own jokes and sketches normally. And so I started off doing that in school, just writing little sketches for me to perform for my school friends. And then I realised that there was so much, it was very exciting to write because you're starting with a blank piece of paper and it all comes out of your mind and it's just a special thing to do. And so I think I got more into the writing than the performing. And now I am, I'm, more, I'm spending more of my time writing books than I am performing for people. What do you think makes a good story? I think a really important thing for any good story, if there's budding writers out there, is a good villain. Because if you think about the Harry Potter books, without Voldemort, Harry Potter is just having a lovely day at school. What you need is a villain to make the whole story sing. And I've really loved creating evil villains in my books. And something I learned from Roald Dahl was, if you can make your villains funny too, um, that's always a good thing because if they're a little bit funny, it takes away perhaps a tiny bit from how scary they are, but you can, you can use the two things together. So it's something to think about when you're writing your own stories. Do you walk around with a notebook and, and kind of have ideas on a, in the car or seeing someone else's play and then write those down later on? I do keep a notebook with me all the time <laughs> so I can write down any ideas I have that I think might be, might be good. Some of the ideas come to nothing, but I don't worry about that. There's another one's going to come along. Now, Winuna East Primary School. Yes. yes. Hello. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. Now, do we have a student there who's going to ask the next question for David? Yes. 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 My name is Clara, and our question is, are any of your stories based on your childhood experiences? Fantastic. So the question from Clara was, are any of your stories based on your own childhood experiences? Great question. Hi, Clara. Yes, they are. When I was younger, my sister used to dress me up as a girl. She used to put me in this bridesmaid's dress that she had 
a fur hat, give me a handbag, and she would parade me up and down the street where we lived. The last time was about two or three years ago. <laughs> it was when I was a kid. So in a way, I was the boy in a dress. And I had a granny that I thought was boring until I asked her about her experiences during World War II, which she'd lived through, uh, living in London. And it turned out she'd had this really exciting life. And that, in a way, gave me the idea for Gangster Granny. So you can definitely draw on your own experience. It doesn't mean you have to write exactly what happened to you, but you can certainly be inspired by it. It certainly helps if you are. Um, and that's what makes a story personal to you. That's why it's your story and not someone else's. Now, you spoke a little bit earlier about having a love of comedy and wanting to be a comedian. How has that shaped how you tell stories? Well, I try and make my books as funny as possible. I think most people like a laugh, so I try and put lots of humour in. But also, I feel like you want to balance out the humour with other things like scary, scary aspects to your story or perhaps thrilling aspects. Bad Dad's got lots of car chases in it, which is something I love watching movies with car chases, like spy movies, like James Bond films. Um, and so for me, it's, it's balancing all the things out. Comedy, I think, is the central uh, thing that I'm interested in, but I think if it was just comedy and nothing else going on in the books, they might start to become perhaps a little boring. And so I, I like the idea that, you know, I can go off into different territory and sometimes have sad endings like at the end of Gangster Granny. How do you know what kids want? You really seem to be able to put yourself into that place of hearing a story as a kid. How do you know that? How, what uh, you well, if I do know that, it's probably because I've never grown up. <laughs> because I think if you're doing the kind of things I do on television, acting, playing different characters, it's a lot like playing. Mm. It's a lot like being a child again. So I think there's an important thing for grown-ups is not to become serious and boring, but to stay in touch with their playful side. Yeah. And so hopefully that's something I've done and that's perhaps why um, I, I love writing for children so much. Yeah, great. Our next question comes from Wheeler Heights. My name is Lily. What is the process you go through when you're starting a new book? Great. Ah, that's a good question. So Lily's asking, what is the process I go through when starting a new book? Well. In truth, Lily, I put it off for as long as possible. It's a bit like doing homework. Well, you might be very good at doing homework, but some people always do it at the last minute, don't they, on the bus on the way to school. And I spent a long time thinking about the story, making notes, perhaps thinking, well, I'd quite like to maybe watch this film. That may give me some inspiration. Basically, anything to stop me actually writing <laughs> the book. But Because it's a bit like... When you think about starting writing, it's a bit like you're at the bottom of a mountain and you're looking up and going, oh, I've got to climb all the way to the top. But then you find that halfway up, you're having quite a good time and it's a really nice view. And then when you get to the top, it's a brilliant feeling. And so uh, the thing is, I make notes and start writing. And although I've made notes and planned out the story a little bit, I'm alive to things that could happen in the moment. And that helps. Like, for example, when I started writing Gangster Granny, I never knew the Queen would appear in the story. And that's one of the most famous scenes in the book. So I feel like do a little bit of planning, but also be completely alive in the moment to a fresh idea that you might have that could, in fact, turn the whole story on its head. Have you ever had a chat with the Queen about her being in your book? Have I ever had a chat to the Queen about her being in my book? I have had a few chats to the Queen. But one thing you're told when you meet the Queen is you're not allowed to ask her any questions, <laughs> which is, makes conversation quite hard. So as much as I want to say, did you know you were in my book? I haven't, I haven't ever done that. <laughs> I don't know if she knows or she's interested. She's been in lots of different books over the years and plays and films. She probably knows. She's probably a little bit pleased. I would be if I was her. Yeah, me too. Our next question comes from St Joseph's Parish Primary. What is the reason behind so many of your book titles using alliteration? Well, I think using alliteration makes for snappy titles sometimes, mm -hmm. memorable titles. And you do want a memorable title for a book, one that people are going to remember. You don't want them to go, have you read that book? What's it called? Mm, I can't remember. It's better if they say, oh, have you read Gangster Granny or Awful Auntie? Um, they don't all have alliteration. They Boy in the Dress, Mr Stink, Billionaire Boy does. Um, I suppose I'm just looking for a snappy title that also means that people understand what the book might be about. Mm. 
and that also is intriguing. So they go, a granny who's a gangster, that's unusual. Um, so it does help, I think, to have hopefully snappy titles. Yeah. And alliteration is just one of the things you can use to create a snappy title. Right. But some titles are really simple, like, you know, Roald Dahl's The Master, he calls one of his books Matilda. It's a very simple title, really, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't particularly tell you anything, anything. about the story, yeah. but you'll still want to read it because it's Roald Dahl. The Witches, that's a really great title. I like The Twits. And Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is a great piece of alliteration as well, isn't yeah. it? Charlie, chocolate, just sounds good. The next one comes from Wiley Park Public School. Could the teacher there unmute? Hello, David Williams. Um, we're we're Wiley Park Public School, and um, we want to ask you a question. Can you tell us something about the real people on whom you based your characters? Can you tell them something about the real people on whom you based some of your characters? Wow. Uh, well, the character of Raj, who's the news agent who's in all my books, is based on my real news agent, where I live in London. The street up from the street I live in uh, had a shop called Raj's News, and it was very, very messy. And, but he was a very jolly man. He didn't have special offers, I made that up, but he did have a messy shop. And, uh, and so I based the character on him. But then one day the shop was closed and it had moved away and I don't know where he's gone. Oh, so I don't even know if he knows that he's the inspiration for the character or not. Wow. Oh, wow, that's, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. <coughs> now, me. you've ended up acting in a lot of the adaptations mm. of your books. Who's been your favourite character to play? Well, it's really fun to play villains. And so... I've just done an adaptation of Ratburger, where I play the evil villain Bert, and I had a lot of fun playing him. It's something because he's very grotesque, he's very disgustingly ugly and and dirty and unpleasant, and um, and to become that kind of character every morning is a lot of fun, and to be to be scary and hopefully a bit funny as well. So I loved playing him, and it's a, it's a more it's a bigger role for me really because I've only often played small roles. I played the Prime Minister in Mr Stink and some children in the UK think I'm the real Prime Minister because they <laughs> saw me in Mr Stink, but unfortunately I'm not. Hands up if you have read Billionaire Boy. Oh, look at all those hands. Me too. I loved it. And we have a question from Murray Farm about Billionaire Boy. Is there a student there at Murray, Murray Farm? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Off you go. Hi David, my name is Feifei. What was the inspiration for Billionaire Boy? The question from Feifei is, what was your inspiration for writing Billionaire Boy? My inspiration for writing Billionaire Boy was that I'd meet lots of kids and I'd ask them what they wanted to do with their life. And lots of them would say, I'd like to be rich and famous. And I'd say, well, how are you going to be rich and famous? And they go, well, no, I just like to be rich and famous. <laughs> which I get, it seems like it would be fun just to be rich and famous, right? Um, but having met some people who are rich and famous, they're not necessarily happy because they're rich and famous. It, it, you're happy because you're, you're, you love somebody, you're loved, you have a great family situation, whatever it might be. Um, and so I suppose I wanted to create a story about how to sort of be careful what you wish for because if you had all the money in the world but no friends, that wouldn't be fun at all. Yeah. Now, we are so lucky because David is actually going to read a little section of the book for us. Whereabouts are we going to start? Well, I thought I would start at the very beginning. Mm, very good place to start. And I'm going to read out loud in case you thought a bit boring just to watch him read a book. So I'm going to read it to you. And so this is Billionaire Boy by David Williams, which is me. And this is chapter one, Meet Joe Spud. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a million dollars or a billion? How about a trillion or even a gazillion? Meet Joe Spud. Joe didn't have to imagine what it would be like to have loads and loads and loads of money. He was only 12, but he was ridiculously, preposterously rich. Joe had everything he could ever want. 
a 100-inch plasma widescreen, flat-screen, high-definition TV in every room in the house. Tick. 500 pairs of Nike trainers. Tick. A Grand Prix racetrack in the back garden. Tick. A robot dog from Japan. Tick. A golf buggy with the number plate Spud 2 to drive around the grounds of his house. Tick. A water slide which went from his bedroom into an indoor Olympic-sized swimming pool. Tick. Every computer game in the world. Tick. 3D IMAX cinema in the basement. Tick. A crocodile. Tick. 24-hour personal masseuse. Tick. Underground 10-lane bowling alley. Tick. Snooker table, popcorn dispenser, skateboard park, another crocodile. $100,000 a week pocket money, a roller coaster in the back garden, a professional recording studio in the attic, personalised football coaching from the England team, a real-life shark in a tank. Tick, 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 tick. He had them all. In short, Joe was one horribly spoilt kid. He went to a ridiculously posh school. He flew on private planes whenever he went on holiday. Once, he even had Disney World closed for the day, just so he wouldn't have to queue for any rides. Here's Joe, speeding around his own private racetrack in his own Formula One racing car. Some very rich children have miniature versions of cars specially built for them. Joe wasn't one of those children. Joe needed his Formula One car made a bit bigger. He was quite large, you see. Well, he would be, wouldn't you, if you could buy all the chocolate in the world. You will have noticed that Joe is on his own in that picture. To tell the truth, speeding around a racetrack isn't that much fun when you're on your own. Even if you do have a squillion dollars, you really need someone to race against. The problem was, Joe didn't have any friends. Not one. Friends cross. There we are. Now, our first question after hearing a little bit of Billionaire Boy comes from Oatley West. What did you want kids to be thinking about after reading Billionaire Boy? Well, I wanted them to think about what aspirations they have, what dreams they have for their own future. Because there is a phenomenon now of people just being rich and famous without really having a job. When I was growing up, You'd have to be rich and famous for doing something. Perhaps you might be an actor in movies. Perhaps you might be a singer. Perhaps you might have been to the moon. Something exciting may have happened to you or you may be special in some way because of something you've done. And obviously now there are people who are just rich and famous. I can only think of like Kim Kardashian, if you've heard (laughs) of her. Um, But I think it's dangerous for people to want to be like that because it's quite empty, I think, just wanting to... I don't know, have your picture taken all day and go shopping and I just think much more interesting to spend your life helping other people, doing something worthwhile, um, being a teacher, being a vet, being a doctor. You know, there's so many other things you can do with your life. And so really I was trying to just steer children, I think, in a way, away from just thinking it would be great to be rich and famous because in itself those things mean nothing. If you are a singer and you you become incredibly successful, you're Adele or someone and you become rich and famous as a result, Mm. wonderful. Mm. But that's just a byproduct of what she does and what she does is she writes songs and sings them. Now some of um, your, the the illustrations in the book the kids just saw as you were reading, what is the relationship between you and the illustrator? You've worked not only with Tony Ross, but also with the same illustrator that did Roald Dahl's books. Yes, my first two books, The Boy in the Dress and Mr Stink, were illustrated by Sir Quentin Blake, Mm. who's gone on to illustrate all of Roald Dahl's books. Um, So it was a real thrill working with him. He's now in his 80s and he's a knight, which is why we call him Sir because he's such a special person. He's done so much over the years um, that he was given this special award. And I got to ask him loads of questions about Roald Dahl and bore him to tears because I wanted to hear about my hero uh, from someone who really knew him. And, and then Quentin passed the baton to Tony Ross, who did Billionaire Boy and, uh, and all the books since. And he's done a brilliant job. So I'm very happy. The relationship is that I write the words and I pretty much let them get on with what they do because they're so good at what they do. But there are some people, very, very talented people, 
like I'm thinking about Dr. Seuss, who wrote The Cat in the Hat, and I love Dr. Seuss, who did the words and the pictures. Mm. Now that to me is incredible because I can't draw at all. So I'm in complete awe of anyone who can draw and anyone who can do both. That's a very, very special talent. Now, later on in the chapter that you just read, we uh, get introduced to one of the characters, Leonard Spud, who has worked his whole life really, really hard and then finally comes up with an invention that brings him lots and lots of money and he becomes a millionaire, mm. billionaire. But like a lot of your characters, they're endearing, they're so likeable, but they have a little flaw in them. What mm. would you say his flaw is? Well, flaws are generally what make comedy characters comedy characters because if you're a completely perfect person, which actually no one is, you're not going to be funny in any way. Um, so Len Spud, he works in a toilet roll factory and he's thinking of different ways toilet roll could be changed and he comes up with this toilet roll that's dry on one side and, uh, and moist on the other. Now I think that's a good idea. And I don't know why no one's done it, but anyway. And he calls it Bum Fresh 3000, and it becomes a huge success, and he makes billions and billions of pounds. But his flaw is he loses touch with what's important. He starts ignoring his son, and he doesn't seem to be at all worried that his son is lonely and sad because he doesn't have any friends. So he gets distracted by all the money, and he loses sight of what's really important. And there's nothing more important than love. And as a father myself, the love you have for your child is incredible and to I don't know to, to not to not nurture that love to not actually be a, a parent and be a great dad to, to, to your child is you know is a, is a big mistake because it's the best relationship I think you'll ever have in your life are you happy to read a little bit more yes I read a little bit more uh, from chapter two and this is a little bit rude so I hope that's okay. <laughs> hope you like rude stories. This chapter is called Bum Boy. Bum Boy, said Joe. Bum Boy, spluttered Mr Spud. What else do they call you at school, son? The bog roll kid. Mr Spud shook his head in disbelief. He had sent his son to the most expensive school in England, St Cuthbert's School for Boys. The fees were $200,000 a term, and all the boys had to wear Elizabethan ruffs and tights. Here is a picture of Joe in his school uniform. He looks a bit silly, doesn't he? So the last thing that Mr Spud expected was that his son would get bullied. Bullying was something that happened to poor people. But the truth was that Joe had been picked on ever since he started at the school. The posh kids hated him because his dad had made his money out of loo rolls. They said that that was awfully vulgar. Bottom billionaire, the bum wipe heir, master plot paper, continued Joe, and that's just the teachers. Most of the boys at Joe's school were princes or at least dukes or earls. Their family had made their fortune from owning lots of land. That made them old money. Joe had quickly come to learn that money was only worth having if it was old. New money from selling loo rolls didn't count. The posh boys at St Cuthbert's had names like Nathaniel, Septimus, Ernest, Bertram, Lysander, Tybalt, Zacharias, Edmund, Alexander, Humphrey, Percy, Quentin, Tristan, Augustus, Bartholomew, Tarkin, Imogen, Sebastian, Theodore, Clarence, Smythe. And that was just one boy. <laughs> it's so good that you've stopped at that point because this is the next question that I've got for, for you. In uh, all of your books, but in Billionaire Boy in particular, you've got a lot of lists of things. So you've got mm. the school timetable, the canteen menu, the list that you just read out of all the names, the teachers' names. What, why do you use that literary device? Well, I like lists because I feel you can pack a lot of jokes into lists. You know, if you're trying to think of... 10 uh, funny things that a teacher does, you know, and you list them, it just means hopefully you'll have 10 jokes. Uh, whereas if you put them in a paragraph, uh, it might take a little longer to explain them all and you've got to connect them all up. So for me, it's just a way of like, just getting joke after joke after joke after joke. And also I'm thinking about kids reading these books and so not everybody uh, has read, you know, the entire Harry Potter saga 
not every child has read all of the Lord of the Rings, whatever. Some children, they see books and they're a little bit scared of reading them because they think they're going to be complicated, difficult. Um, and so I want the books to feel as fun as possible. Lots of illustrations, lots of words jumping out of the text, lots of jokes. Um, so hopefully it'll just be fun to read. You know, there are books that your teachers or your parents might encourage you to read, but I, I want these books to be ones that you, as kids, just want to read yourself. Mm. And you just think of it as something fun to do rather than, you know, homework or something. Mm, having to read, yeah. Yeah. There's one other list in the book, the rude words. Mm. How do you come up with words that sound rude but don't actually relate to our life today? Well, there is another literary device which is actually quite a hard word. It's called onomatopoeia. Mm. And it means words that sound like the thing they're describing. An example I'd say to you is maybe elbow. That's sort of interesting, isn't it? An elbow bends like that and the word feels like it goes L bow. Um, so I came up with words that I think sounded rude, sounded like they were referring to something rude, but weren't quite. And I had a lot of fun creating that list. What's your favourite one? Uh, I'd have to have a look, actually, because I've... Oh, here we are. I'll read some for you. Puttock, Crunter, Noog, Smagger, Mingmong, Clasbo, Furp, Fedger, Nadgers, Blimblam, Koobdriz, Trunt, Jufa, Bullmunter, Gunda, Wizplop, Bwata, Lopcroc, Musa, Frink, and Dangle Spangles. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where any of those things are, but Dangle Spangles sounds fun. Bula Bula is another one. Where does that live in your brain? Uh, well, really at the front of my brain. I'm just looking at these. I haven't read these. Pognots, Vugan Bits. Gooliging, Ponk, Blunkers, Pum Pum, Minky, and a Vart, which is V-A-R-T. So I suppose that sounds a little bit like, mm. doesn't it? But I've called it a Vart, so <laughs> there we are. It's a made-up word. It's fun to make up words. And my hero, Roald Dahl, made up words in The Big Friendly Giant. Like Whiz, or even Whiz Popper. Yeah, so he, he, yeah. he's made up loads of words uh, in his books. So I kind of thought, well, I can do it too. Um, so I think it's all right... Hopefully I've never copied him exactly, but been influenced by him. And I think that's something for any of you budding writers. There's no shame in being really influenced by someone whose books you love, or they don't want to copy their ideas exactly. For example, if I woke up one day and wrote, I'm going to write a book about a boy who goes to a chocolate factory and meets a funny character called Willy Wonka, that would be a mistake because that's already been done. But to try and capture his spirit, Roald Dahl's spirit, where it's you've got lots of humour, lots of scary aspects... Um, that is something you can definitely do. Yeah. Another device that you've done in the book is you've come up with words for actions that we may not necessarily have a word for today, mm. like bum jumping. Mm. But everyone can kind of relate to that. They kind of know what that w means, what it feels like to do, but you've come up with a word. Bum jumping, yes. Yeah. Um, I think the definition is, well, you're sort of moving yourself along on the floor yeah. by moving your bum up and down. We've all done it. We've all done if it. If we're too lazy to get up. That's right. Um, so, yes, I have a lot of fun. And I like the books being a little bit naughty. I like the idea that they're a little bit forbidden because I remember reading Roald Dahl books when I was a kid, things like The Witches. It's very scary, The Witches. It feels like you shouldn't really be reading it. And that's a very exciting feeling. Mm. And the other device that you use is you'll, you'll break the story and go directly to the reader mm. and ask them a question, for example, when you ask them to look at a picture of the grubs and to spot the differences. What mm. device is that for? Well, I suppose that's me as the author talking directly to the reader. And it's something that, again, Roald Dahl has done. Lots of other writers have done it too. But it, it just helps, I think, the feeling like you're being told a story. It just feels a bit more intimate, a bit more personal, and it means that the person telling the story has a kind of voice. You know, it's like they're telling a story for a certain reason. They have a certain take on the story. And uh, Roald Dahl has that quite a lot, which is... I remember I was recently reading uh, James and the Giant Peach, and James's parents get killed very early on in the story. By, they're basically trampled by a rhinoceros that's escaped from the zoo. And Roald Dahl deals with it so quickly 
he says something like, well, it, was, it wasn't really any bother for them because it was over so quickly. Um, but for James, it was a problem. And it's just so brilliantly thrown away. And you think only Roald Dahl could be just so, so kind of throwaway about people being trampled to death by a rhinoceros. Yes. But it makes it funny. We actually have a question from Birmingham Primary School. What was your question? We were wondering how you came up with all the names for your characters. Oh, great. The question is, how did you come up with all the names for your characters? Ah, oh, well, I think you want the names to stand out for some of the kind of unusual characters, like Mr Stink. You know, he's got to have a memorable name. If I just called him John or something, it wouldn't be very interesting. He's got to have a name that no one else has because he's such an unusual character. Um, I liked calling, in, in, in this book, Billionaire Boy, I liked that he was called Joe Spud because I was trying to think of a name that sounded very normal. And Spud is a slang word for potato. So it, it, someone called Joe Spud doesn't sound particularly, I don't know, posh or rich or anything, do they? They sound like quite a normal person. Mm. So sometimes words help you because spud, you know, a potato, that's a nice, that's a nice cheap thing that lots of people eat. Um, and then sometimes for the ch children's characters, I like them to have quite simple names because I think if you call the children at the centre of the story a very unusual name, sometimes that might be off-putting to some children. That's again something that, that Roald Dahl does so well. It's just called Charlie, isn't he? Mm. Charlie Bucket is his name. Again, that suggests someone who's not very rich. A bucket is a very ordinary, everyday thing. Um, and, so, and so, yes, I try and think of a name that slightly sums up the character in some way, but perhaps in an unusual, in an unusual way. Miss Root is the name of the demon dentist. And, of course, all our teeth have roots. So it felt sort of just about right that you'd call her that. So uh, I have fun coming up with the names. And sometimes I change them quite late on. Um, because I kind of constantly thinking, oh, what should they be called? What should they be called? And sometimes I like not giving them names really, like Grandpa and Grandpa's case of scrape is just called Grandpa. And I think that helps because it makes you think that he could be your grandpa. Yeah. If you gave him, you know, too much of an identity apart from that, you might be, I don't know. I just think I want every child to read that book and think that could be their grandpa. Mm. Mm. Now, let's talk about some of the other characters that make an appearance in Billionaire Boy. Joe Spud has everything a boy could want, except for one thing, and that's a friend. And then he meets Bob, and he and Bob share something in common, unfortunately, which is being bullied. Mm. Why, why, do they, why did you have both of them experience that and come together? Well, when I was at school, once a year, we'd have to do a cross-country run. So after having not run at all, all year, suddenly you're expected to be able to run three miles. <laughs> you know, think in England as well, how cold and wet and muddy it was. And so I'd always be at the back. You know, I'd always be walking because I couldn't run for three miles nonstop. And it would be me and someone else, you know, a, a, another boy who was probably, again, like me, a bit, a bit overweight and not sporty. And we'd walk... Um, and then we, we, would, we would basically just run the last 100 metres, but by which time everyone else had got changed and was kind of there to sort of jeer at us a bit and laugh at us a bit as we crossed the finish line. So that's something I took from my own experience and put in the book. Um, as for bullying, sadly, as much as you would love bullying to stop now, forever, unfortunately it does carry on, doesn't it? And it's something lots of children experience in one way or another. Some children are bullied and, and bully others. I mean, it's, it's unfortunately, it's there in life as much as we try and discourage it. Um, and so I thought it was something that could bring a couple of characters together, which is they both had this bad experience of being bullied. And I had a lot of fun creating the characters of the bullies, the grub twins, these identical twins, although one's a boy and one's a girl, <laughs> uh, but no one can tell them apart. So I had a lot of fun having a laugh at the bullies, really. Yeah, that, that's a... They're su it's such a great device having the, the two of them and they're always... Ch and uh, oh, the other one also, obviously, is Mrs Trafe and they always go to the cafeteria or the canteen but they never really eat, do they? No. And she's ended up in this job where, obviously, she doesn't really know how to cook or she cooks these extremely, extremely um, bizarre foods. Why... How did she end up there as a cook? Well... Is there a bit of what we would call backstory 
that you probably only know? Well, I, when I was at school, we had this very scary dinner lady called Mrs. Pierce. And if you made a comment about her food, she had this big metal ladle, this massive spoon, and she'd go, I'll wrap your knuckles faster than you can say Jack Spratt. And we'd all be absolutely terrified of her. Um, and so I was thinking about a dinner lady who makes horrible, horrible food because some, some, some school dinners are nice. I don't want to say that your school dinners are nice. They, they might be really nice. But um, when I was a kid, they weren't. And so she has all these horrible, horrible, uh, all these horrible dishes like instead of jelly and ice cream, it's like jellyfish and ice cream, that kind of thing. Um, how does she end up working there? Well, she's probably been there for about 40 years and no one can get rid of her. So she's been there for years and years and years making this disgusting food, which incidentally she doesn't eat herself. <laughs> she brings in sandwiches, which I thought was quite fun as well. Because it's like, oh, I don't eat that. Um, and I actually played her in the TV adaptation. And I had a lot of fun playing Mrs. Trafe. Again, this rather grotesque character. So much fun to look in the mirror and see someone else and play a different part. It's one of the, for me, it's a, an amazing thrill. So as much as I love writing, I'd hate to give up acting forever. Do you choose which character you'd like to play when they are made? Do you I do, ask I do, yourself? I do get to choose, really, yes, <laughs> because I've been writing the script and then also have a company that make the shows. So unless people around me are going, oh, no, 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 you can't do that, you won't be any good at that, then generally I do it. But um, I try not to have the biggest roles. I tend to have smaller roles, although in Rat Burger I have got a pretty big role because I'm the villain. But uh, it's, it's a very unusual thing. Most authors don't get to be in their own yeah. the film adaptations of their own work, do they? I can't think of any others. There must be some, but I can't think of any. Mrs. Traif gets a really big gift from Joe. Mm. How did, did you go through that transformation when you played Mrs. Traif? Well, so what happens is Mrs. Traif comes to Joe and asks for some money because she needs a hip replacement. <laughs> And then she ends up spending all the money on lots of plastic surgery. So she has a, a facelift and her lips done and this, that and the other. And she doesn't have her, her, have her hip done at all. So she basically wastes the money that he gives her. Um, and so, yes, I did transform. I'm not sure I ended up looking all that beautiful um, <laughs> as a woman. With plastic, quite a hard thing to do because I was dressed as a woman and then I had to look like better than I did. I'm not sure I looked all that different. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it, interesting, because I wanted to show that it wasn't just Joe and his father that sort of had a weird relationship with money, wasted money. It was something that lots of people could do too. And someone who needs a hip replacement, which is a big serious thing, I help you walk better, is going to waste the money, you know, having silly things done to their face. Yeah. Now we've kind of finished the questions to do with Billionaire Boy, but we do have two really fantastic questions that came in that are a little bit more... Um, a little bit more general. Okay. So we're going to go to Carlton South Public School. How can I get even naughtier than I already am? <laughs> How can I get even more naughtier than I already am? How can they get even yeah. naughtier? Well, you could be in one of my books, The World's Worst Children, because I have a lot of fun coming up with those books. I've done a couple of books of short stories. Well, I've really let my imagination run riot. There's a boy who picks his nose called Peter Picker and he creates <laughs> the world's biggest bogey. It becomes so big that it rolls around the world, sticking to things and picking them up. So it'll pick up like where we are now, the Sydney Opera House, and it'll get stuck to this giant bogey and roll around the world. So I had a lot of fun creating stories like that. And I think that's where the naughtiest children are. So you'll have to write to me and tell me why you think you're really naughty and why you should be in The World's Worst Children 3. I probably wouldn't do it now, though, like just before Christmas. Would you advise that? Well, mm. don't be naughty now. No. no. Wait until you've got your presents. That's right. And then start being naughty. Yeah, again. I would wait. Wait until after Christmas. The, la the final question for day mm. today actually comes from Banks Public School. I'm going to ask this question. What is your next book going to be about? Well, I'm just thinking about that at the moment. I've started writing The World's Worst Children 3, and I've met lots of school kids in Australia, which have given me lots of ideas, because <laughs> um, they're a bit cheekier, I think, than a lot of British kids. And then after that, I want to write some book around the world of monsters in some way. I've become quite interested in monsters, reading books to my, to my son about trolls and ogres and cyclopses. And I, I feel like I really want to do something around that, but I don't really know what yet. So I'm trying to think. Um, 
of a story. I haven't quite got my way into it yet, so I'll keep on thinking. Do you quite often have numerous going at once? Yeah, I you... normally have a few stories sort of just buzzing around my head and then one of them becomes the one I, I concentrate on. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, you know. It, it's not, I love doing it, it's not that easy. And of course, when you've had success, it's wonderful to have success, but it creates a lot of expectations. So now you think, oh, all these kids who like my books. The next one's got to be really good. You know, I don't want to let them down. So, uh, so yes, I, I've got to think long and hard about what the next one's going to be. Right. Well, unfortunately, that is the end of our digital author tour for today. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you've enjoyed learning more about David and Billionaire Boy and about how ideas can become books and then books can become plays. So I think we should all give a really big thank you to David for joining us here today. Thank you so much and for being here. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone out there in internet land. It's been lovely talking to you all. See you later bye from bye. the Opera House. Bye.